All right, we rolling? All right, cool. And so are we, in very important question, yes. Kevin, are we or aren't we allowed to drop the F-bomb? You can drop as many F-bombs as you want. Okay. Yeah. This is not a OTA, as they like okay. to say in radio. I thought but I that never I, stopped you before, Avril. I thought I kind of got in trouble last time. <laughs> you guys like told me not to, and then it like happened like 10 times. Well, it was, um, you weren't even it the first live. one. It was, well, it was live, yeah. but it was like, um, we started doing live shows out of here, and uh, we had a lot of newer artists too that had never done like, you know, radio before. And it was like every time, because they get a notification when I hit the dump button. It's like a big deal. Yeah. And just the LA night shows, just hitting the dump button like every, <laughs> every single night. It was hilarious. So when you guys are recording live, mm-hmm. do you have like a delay? So just like 30 case. seconds. Oh, that's. That's a long time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jaden was here on his album release day, and he did, he gave this really heartfelt message about how much it meant working with MGK yeah. and Lil Aaron on Wannabe. We're about to premiere Wannabe, and it all got wiped because it fucking during it. Oh my and so God. when you listen to it on the air, he's like, uh, yeah, 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 say a few words, and then the song just yeah. starts. Um, but it's very funny. It's, all right. So we're rocking and rolling. Beautiful. We're rocking and rolling with our uh, what do we got? Blue Labat Labat Blue Canadian Zone. beers, and I like drinking beer out of bottles. I mean, out of cans, yeah, it's fun. You can shotgun, but like, it tastes better out of the bottle. I agree, but I I know like beer. I'm not a, like I love beer, but I'm not one of those like fancy beer guys. But I don't even like getting it out of the draft. I like the bottle more. But I, isn't the draft better? Yes, uh, yeah, definitely the best. Oh, so you'll go draft over bottle? Yes. Okay. But like, I want to learn the hierarchy. Bottle for sure. Over um, can. well, thank you for the birthday gifts. Yeah. If that for day. something if something went wrong in the edit, uh, you brought me birthday <laughs> gifts. You brought me amazing merchandise, Avril. Uh, <laughs> you've you flattered me with the beer and the uh, and the pizza here. Um, which uh, you kind of had to earn favor back here because the last time you were here, you kind of crashed the party. You weren't necessarily invited, Avril. <laughs> 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 and, and so you decide to crash the party uh, and help yourself to some wine backstage at K-Rock yeah. <laughs> and then uh, pr- proceed to drop an F-bomb on national radio. What else is new? That's, that's called a re-entry. <laughs> Welcome back. This is fantastic. Thank you. It's so good to see you. Um, there's so much I want to talk to you about. I guess let's start. Uh, I want to talk about Bite Me, but then we, let's go in chronological mm-hmm. order just for a second because there is so much to talk about um, from back then to now. Um, you brought me the Canadian beer. I read an incredible stat. I know I'm far more of a chart geek and a stat geek than probably you ever are. Um, but your debut album, which is going to turn 20 next year, we'll talk all about it, is the best-selling record by a Canadian artist in the 21st century. Which you might go, oh, Canada, whatever. That's a country that is home to Justin Bieber, The Weeknd, Shawn Mendes, and a guy named Drake. And let alone your <laughs> debut album is the best-selling record of the 21st century. I mean, that is pretty incredible. That's crazy. That's so gnarly. Like, I remember... I was so young, like I was seven, 16 when I wrote that record, 17 when I put out my first single, Complicated, then Skater Boy and all that took off, and it took off right away. I had like no idea what I was even doing, I just knew that I loved music, like and I didn't even really totally get it, like when I went to Hollywood to like write. I was like, oh, Hollywood. Like, I I didn't, like, live at home in Canada, like, growing up being like, I want to go to Hollywood. I want to make it. It was just like, I just want to sing, you know? And it all kind of, like, happened. And, yeah, that whole, like, album cycle was, like, super special. But, like, when I was super young, 17, my manager kept coming up to me and telling me stats and stuff. And I never know them, and I still don't. And she'd be like, you realize, like, your record's number one. And she'd be like looking at me like this, and I'd be like, "Cool." <laughs> yeah. Do you th- do you th- <laughs> right. All I know, like, it was more. It would register more to me when, like, I would hear myself on the radio. Like that was like huge, and it still is. Like to this day, like filming in the car and I hear myself on the radio, I'm like, "I made it." <laughs> it's so cool. Do you- or if like I win an award or something, that's like that's when I feel it. Do you think that that actually helped you? You know, because you think about if yeah. you were so tied to the numbers and you had to yeah. follow up Let Go and, you yeah. know, you had to follow up the second record and you had to follow up Girlfriend. Like, if you were so preoccupied with that, the commercial yeah. viability of it uh-huh. all, right? Which you continued. I mean, the longevity is like, you know, it's, it mm-hmm. goes without saying with you. Do you think that actually helped you? I think it was, like, weirdly kind of pure and, like, innocent. Like, I, I didn't even, like, I didn't know what a lot of it meant. Like, I was 15 when I went to New York and, like, like writing and like singing for people and like LA rediscovered me and like signed me and like it's it sounds kind of crazy but like I, like I kind of didn't even know what a record deal was or like a publishing deal and like all these terms were getting thrown around and I just like I was just like a girl with a guitar and I started like writing and I'd been singing since I was a child and it was just very like natural 
I mean, like, I feel like obviously it was like meant to happen. I've worked very hard and and all that. But it was like there was just this like love and passion for it. And I just like wanted it really bad. But I feel like it was like supposed to happen. Um, And so, yeah, I didn't know a lot that was going on around me at the time because I was so young. And I was really just focused on like getting up on stage and playing guitar and or sitting in my hotel room with a guitar writing songs and I kind of just lived in my own world. And you stayed focused. Yeah. So you start singing, you know, country and, you know, it's, it's well publicized. You know, you win this contest and you perform with Shia Twain. And, but then when you get to the, the, the time of making your first record, you're very adamant about it sounding like a rock record yeah. and having a band. And so where does the love of rock, like where do you go from, you know, a country in the pop land to, to the love of rock, the affinity for that sound? So when I started singing, like, I don't know if I was like five or seven or what, but like I went to church and every Sunday and that's where I started singing is like my mom had like mentioned to the church like choir director like that I I sing and she'd love to get me up on stage. So they like finally like years later because they were like, she's too young, she's too young. And then finally they allowed me to sing in the adult cantata christmas cantata and i sang and everyone was like oh my god she can sing so then they just like continued having me sing at like uh different christmas concerts in the church and so that's where like that started then the next that's where i really started was in church and then the next step for me was like performing at fairs and like banquets and whatnot around town and it was like country fairs and stuff and like I actually like country music like I'd come home and watch music videos after school and that's like one of my favorite things to do and I'd watch CMT or I'd watch um, in Canada it's called much music of course and um, and so I would like cover the Dixie Chicks Faith Hill Dina Carter and then I do remember hitting a point, an age when I was around 15, and I was like, Ugh. I just like don't want to sing like gospel music and country music, and I was like becoming a teenager and like uh, growing into like who I was as a person, and I was getting like a little rebellious. I entered high school, I was wearing baggy clothes, I started like drinking beer and skateboarding, and. Um, I, I had a moment where I was like, these songs aren't cool. Like, I don't want to be singing these. And, like, I told my parents, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, that. And that that was, like, that could have been, like, a gnarly moment where, like, I stopped. But what actually happened was that's when I grabbed the guitar and started to write my own songs without even really knowing what I was doing. Like, I knew a G chord. My dad had a guitar laying around. And um, and that's when I started writing the songs that are like my songs, my style. Um, and when I got into high school, I was like into bands like Blink-182 and Green Day and No Effects. And like started skateboarding and hanging out with skaters and going to like cool like band, um, high school band events with different bands playing. And that's when it all sort of changed. So when I went from like a young girl, seven, eight, nine, ten, into like turning to like 15, first year of high school. But I think there's even an even bigger story there because so much of your legacy, right? Like, take the hit records aside, is the icon that you are for so many young girls. And here you are as a young girl, a young woman singing, you know, Dixie Chicks and predominantly country songs because you probably saw yourself in those people because there weren't any sort of icons in the world of pop punk or rock music mm-hmm. that you saw yourself in as mm-hmm. a teenage girl. And so, you almost had no choice but to sing those songs Mm because what else would you have sung? You know what I mean? And then lo and behold, ironically enough, right, like five years later, you become that image, you become that idol, you become that icon for a generation of of young women. Yeah. And, like, I still love country music to this day. Um, And, yeah, but, like, when I, like, could finally, like, was old enough to, like, have a choice, like, I was, like, loving rock and roll, but I'm just like a music lover and I love all different styles. And then I think once I, you know, got into high school, it was like, okay, yeah, like pop punk bands and like 
like wearing my guitar like super low and like buying going to like the skate stores and like now I can like go buy my own clothes and like going to like a West 49 and like getting the big fat skate shoes and like baggy pants and I still have my West 49 hoodie that I wore in grade nine I like last month found it in my closet um so you're a very sentimental it. person because you were am. telling me you have this like mirror from your your two. parents' basement, yeah, yeah, and then you have, have this hoodie. Hoodies. Yeah, I have two hoodies. I have a hoodie from high school that says "Skateboarding is not a crime" that I literally still have. And a Dude, West... that would go for so much on the vintage market. <laughs> I know what you're talking yes, about, like yes. that line. Yeah, I literally I think one sold for like four hundred dollars the other day. I I'm sh- like a big vintage <laughs> geek, and it's pretty crazy. Okay, I'm gonna bring it back. This album cycle in my wardrobe. Dude, yeah, yeah, you're, you'll turn some heads. Should I should it be in a music video or should I wear it down a red carpet? That'll be like a. I'm not kidding. Like or in the streetwear, like, like a TV performance for like this the single. Yeah. What do you, you pick? I will. Let me think on that okay. and by the end. <laughs> I could wear it with like a tutu or a skirt. <laughs> like that'd be so fun. Um, something I wanted to ask you about is like when you when you. At the time that you came out, right, and you're a teenage artist and you're and you're a, a teenage girl, you're basically like putting these two boxes, and I'm simplifying it for the sake of you know this chat. But you're either like a Britney or a Christina back then, right? Yeah. And when you're just when you're a teenager, whether you're an artist or not, I feel most people just want to fit in, right? And most people just want to like do whatever they can to fit in. You're a very interesting artist because you weren't a Britney or a Christina, and you also didn't want to fit in. You were very outspoken and seemingly had a lot of creative control on that first record. Mm-hmm. You know, you were the one that said, "Yo, these songs aren't working for me in New York. Yeah. I'm going to LA. We got to do this my way." Where did that confidence come from? Because I think it's it's pretty rare when you when you're that young. I just like always knew what I liked and what I didn't like, and like I. I was kind of like a tomboy and like I wanted to play, you know, more guitar driven rock music. And um, at the time, as you're as you just mentioned, like the bubblegum pop with the headsets and like the background dancers was like what was like in at the time. And like that definitely wasn't me. Um, So I just had to like voice that. So like I started when L.A. Reid signed me. He did this really, I like, I can't believe I remember this. Like, I was 15 sitting in his office, and he, like, my mom and I are sitting, like, on the couch in his office, and we're, like, in New York City. Baller office. And I'm like, <laughs> hey. And he's like, you have, he's like, you have, like, your own thing going on. Like, normally we'd have, like, stylists and all those people come in, and, like, you'd find your image. He's like, you have your own thing going on, girl, and you just, like, do what you're doing. And I was like, I had no idea what he meant, but I was like, does this mean I got to keep wearing baggy clothes? Because my parents did, like, everything to get me out of them. (laughs) And I was just like, sweet. So, I mean, L.A. Reid really got me. And so, like, I started making that first record in New York. And that didn't work for me because the person I was working with didn't get me. Uh, The person I was writing with was, like, giving me his songs. And they were just, like, so cheesy. And I was just like, no. Um, I love Celine Dion, but it was, like, kind of more of, like, a ballady, pretty thing. And I was just And did any of those songs ever wind up, like, with another artist? Did everyone, uh, like, ever make See the Light of Day? I don't even think so. Um, But so then, okay, yeah, so then, like, I came out to L.A., and I had much better luck, and I met Cliff Magnus, and I met uh, The Matrix. Mm -hmm. And like, I didn't totally know how to articulate myself, but other than just expressing to them while they were producing, and I'm sitting there staring at the screen, and being in the studio for the first time, and I just kept being like, just make it sound more like a band. Just like, make it sound more like a band. Like, and it's like, more guitars, and just like, drums and I just was trying to edge everything up as much as possible I wanted to I wanted to rock and so that that was my fight my fight was to like to make rock inspired like um lyrically and musically um music that was just like I was in an angsty place when have I not been (laughs) (laughs) and um and and I got to do that. I pushed as hard as I could. And, like, I think that attitude is definitely there. It's so how do you know it's, like, songs. you know, is it, how instantaneous is it 
back then because we're talking 2002, like summer of 2002 with Complicated and then eventually Skater Boy, right, a couple months later. And we live now in this, like, you know, viral age where things yeah. can truly, like, just pop overnight and it's crazy and yeah. it's ubiquitous. In hindsight, that's what it felt like, right? But how did it feel like for you? Like, do you remember, was there a pinch me moment or, like, sort of that cliche, you know, like, oh, this is, like, massive now with the release of Complicated? Like, when I won my first Moon Man. Yeah. Because I saw that, like, sitting on my couch at home. I saw, like, award shows on TV, and I was just like, oh, I want to do that. Like, I hope I get to do that. And then, like, when I went up on stage and, like, accepted my first award, I was like, whoa, it happened. Yeah. Yeah, like, winning my first award, it was like, whoa. And hearing, uh, hearing Complicated on the radio for the first time was a trip. Where were you? Well... <sighs> I was doing a radio promo tour and I had just left the radio station. So it was like, <laughs> yeah, was at they the had radio to station. play it. <laughs> like, uh, you know, I was like in the car and like we had just left the station. But uh, it, so it's kind of one of those like, I'm on the radio, mom. But like I was just in there. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? But then like I heard myself on the radio a lot. And then that was cool. So what kind of effect does that have on a... 15, 16, 17 year old where you reach this like and almost instantaneously this like cultural ubiquity. Like I, I was talking today about how there's a month there in 2002 where you're on the cover of three different teen magazines. Like it was Teen People, YM and Seventeen. And then like, you know, we talked, I think, before we were rolling about uh, 20 years ago uh, this month, you had the number one pop single in America, the number one hot AC single in America and then actually two records in the top 10 of pop. So, I mean, it was like it, you were everywhere so fast, so soon. But how does and of course, professionally that's you can't wish for a better start but how were you coping with it personally back then I was just really busy and like you you know there wasn't like social media and I wasn't like going online and seeing things I was just like actually like really in the present moment in whatever city I was in so I bet you it's a different experience now for someone who who's in the limelight than it was back then did you feel like you could escape it like, if you weren't watching TV, if you weren't on the radio, if you weren't at the magazine stand, did you feel like you could kind of... Oh, everywhere I went, everyone knew who I was. Like, because I just, like, stood out or something. I don't know. And it's it's always kind of been that way. Like, I'm, people, like, usually recognize me. Um, but at that point, another crazy thing that happened was I had one of my very first shows, and there were, like, um, fans lined up outside of the venue, and they were dressed like me and I was like what what they like had the black eyeliner and straight hair the white wife beater the necktie and I was like P I just remember like I think it was like the Roxy in Vancouver and I just remember like being in a window or something and peeking down or looking out and like that was a trip yeah. Yeah. Well, that eventually got to a point I read that you actually wanted to stop wearing the necktie because it felt almost like a costume for you I don't know. I don't think I really felt that way. I think that was like in an interview and someone kind of like framed it that way. Or, yeah. like, I don't think I ever felt that way. Um, I think maybe like every day of my life, someone pointing out that I wear something probably like got to me a little. But like, um, should I bring the necktie back? Dude, <laughs> you want to talk about like a merch item for tour? I saw those European dates, man. Yeah. Forget about it. Um, you're also a very interesting uh, sort of like, and I feel like it gets lost because you're, you're, you've sold so many records and you've done so many things, but also as a songwriter, you've also given away massive songs. And I've never heard you talk about The Breakaway <laughs> that somehow winds up with Kelly Clarkson. And not only just, it's not like, because that happens sometimes, it rarely becomes the lead single and the name of the album for the other artists. Oh you know gosh, what I mean? Isn't that crazy? But um, is that a song you remember writing and working on? And Yeah, Breakaway was a song that I worked on and co-wrote for my first album, Let Go. And I just didn't like it. <laughs> it's like a ballad. And I was just like, it feels like a church song. Like, it felt like I was just like, not there. Um, but um, it went to Kelly Clarkson, and I'm pretty sure it went number one. And she's an, an incredibly strong, beautiful voice with insane range. And um, she took that song to the next level and fucking, oops. Oh, yeah, I'm allowed to say that. And 
Kelly Clarkson fucking owned it. And yeah, so that was cool. So on my last tour, I actually performed that, put that, added that song into my set list. Oh, that's amazing. For the first time. Have you ever done it with Kelly? No. Really? But um, that would be fun. She's got a talk show now. Mm-hmm. She sings with people. Yeah, you know, she does. Just putting it out there. It's really cool. I love seeing that. Like, she's done a lot with her career. She started on American Idol, like killed it as a singer. She's done like country stuff. She's just like done so much. And now she's a talk show. Like that's so dope. And she's so good at it. Yeah, it's crazy. Avril Lavigne is a Kelly Clarkson historian, we just found out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to fast forward a little bit to uh, the new stuff. Um, and before we talk about Bite Me, and I'm very excited to talk about Bite Me, where does like if you can put like the inception point of this era, if you want to call it an era. It's an era. When does it start? Now, with the red hera. When, <laughs> how new, new is that? Era. <laughs> did you have that in Vegas? Uh, yes. Okay. I did. <laughs> I clearly pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> it was dark. <laughs> we um, were all a couple drinks in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but when does it truly start for you? When um, does the writing start? When does the idea to kind of go back to this sound start for you? Like, okay, so the era for me is like the album cycle. Each album cycle is its own thing for me. Okay. So like, I guess technically I started this album cycle a year ago. Okay, around this time, like fall last year? November. Yep, mid November. Oh, wow. Oh, you know, like the exact time. Oh, I know everything. Is it, was there this big? I know. <laughs> oh my God. I have a calendar, I write everything in it. <laughs> I do. Well, what, what, what was like the, the catalyst moment for you? Um, so, like. <sighs> last November, I should say. Like, why do you, how do you know it's last November? Because Mod Son walked into my ha- showed up in my house, <laughs> knocked on my door, and he, he, we were talking on the phone, and I was like, "Yeah, well, should we write?" And he's like, "Yeah, I'll be there in 20 minutes." And I was like, "Okay, cool." He like walks in, and I'm like, "All right, um, okay." And I grab my guitar, and I had figured out some chords, and then to like a previous idea. And that he had like texted me, and he's like, "I'm on my way." And then like I was playing the guitar, and we were changing it up. And he hung out for like two hours, <clears throat> and then he was like, "Let's get in the studio with John Feldman." And I was like, "Perfect. See you tomorrow." That's when it all started. But it really started with when the pandemic began. Travis Barker. And I got in touch, he hit me up, and he was telling me that he's like producing and asked what I was doing. And um, we decided we wanted to like get in the studio and start writing. So I was like, all right, cool, send me some stuff. And then, like, probably the same week, Modson and I started chatting. And then he dropped Karma, and I was like, this song's awesome. Like, who did you, like, who produced this? Who'd you write this with? And he was like, John Feldman. And I was like, all right, let's get in the studio and fuck some shit up. So, um, everything kind of just sort of, like, organically uh, started. Like, I didn't have a manager. I didn't have a record label. And... Pull that mic a little closer, Evel. uh, I didn't have a manager and a record label. And I sort of just was talking to my friends in the industry and like hanging out with these guys and got and got together with them. So basically I went over to John Feldman's house with Maud's son and we like wrote and recorded like two songs in like one day. It was so much fun. Um that I was like, let's just keep going and then we wrote every day for two weeks and then I was like we could have been done. Like we had enough songs that was like a full album. And a, and a really strong record. And then I just didn't want to stop. I was like having so much fun. I felt like I was really doing what I needed to be doing. And, um, and then we just kept writing and we have like like 30 songs. <laughs> and like then I was in the studio with Travis and we were writing, Travis Barker, we were writing songs together and he's producing. And then um, it was like, like probably the most fun I've ever had making a record and it was nice not having to like answer to anyone and just like drive get in the car drive over the canyon go to Calabasas um 
we were working so early every day, like noon. There was no drinking making that record. Like, <laughs> so we're making up for it today. Yeah. And uh, cheers to that. And I was just like super serious, super focused, and we were having fun. And then Mod started flirting with me, and then I started dating him, and now we're together. <laughs> and then like that happened, and we have a couple songs together, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you crashed an interview or two with him. Yeah. You just reminded me of uh, something that I also have never heard you talk about is uh, Cheers, the Rihanna sample. Yeah. How did that happen? Um, L.A. Reid was working with Rihanna, and they just put, like, my song, I'm With You. They sampled it and put it in her song, Cheers, and that happened. That's cool. Did you guys ever, like, like was there any uh, no, meeting or they no? they just took the sample. Really? And, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, it is. It's wild. Yeah. You have hits with other people that you don't, you know what I mean? <laughs> I know. I it's, forgot about that one. <laughs> I know. It's I did, too, until I go, well, oh, cheers. Why don't I know cheers? Um, well, that's cool. Um in terms of, uh, like, it just sounds like this is the happiest you've been making a record. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was interesting that uh, there's some past interview, maybe a couple of years ago, and you were talking about how you actually, you, at the time, you were saying, well, I write so much better from like sadness or from grief or these things. And it's, you don't necessarily get so inspired when in happy times. But it seems like you're incredibly inspired now in some of the happiest times. When I started the record, I said, I. <laughs> like, writing sessions really turn into therapy sessions, and you're just like, I don't like talking about like super personal stuff like but I do like I really open up for for the songs and with who I'm working with so I said to the guys I was like I was like oh I am so over love right now like I feel like I've had the wind knocked out of me like I feel like really jaded I was like I need I need a minute like I'm just over it I'm gonna do me right now and focus on me and then I was just like love sucks <laughs> and then I wrote the song called love sucks and that was like sort of like the beginning stage the beginning one of the beginning songs um for this record I like started this idea at home brought it into the guys and just told them like this is where I'm at in life and it like felt good to just like hash it out like to just like I mean I know it's, like, funny, like, that I'm, like, yeah, I was a teenager and I wrote, like, angsty songs and I'm still, like, doing that at this point in my life. But, like, I've kind of been through it in love. And it's not easy. And love is hard. And, like, sometimes, like, and I was just at the point where I was, like, love sucks. And um, it always ends bad. It always hurts. Like, <laughs> but, you know. You have to decide, like, you know, that famous saying, is it it's, is worth it to to have loved and lost and to have not loved at all? Mm -hmm. And I am a hopeless rom romantic, and I am a Libra, and I love love. But, like, you know, I was, like, definitely, like, going through, like, I was experiencing, like, heartache, heartbreak at the beginning of the album, making the album. And then during that process of making the record, um... I did like fall in love and like went into a new relationship, and so you kind of like can sort of see that in the album. Oh, so, uh, yeah, that's my next question. Mm -hmm. is, is, do you, it's like, is there a decided difference? You think we're, we'll, you think the fans will hear it? Yeah, I mean, like, part of me was like, is it weird to put like, ang like angsty, like whatever songs and love songs or should it be all one because I have like enough songs for two records so I have like most like so I have a song called I had to put it on it's called kiss me like the world is ending and that was just like a fun like running around Malibu like hanging out with Maud like just like one of those kind of songs and um so I have like both yeah yeah and then I have like so the majority of the record is like it's like fast in your face it's like the most like alternative record from front to back that I've made um and I was just really didn't want ballads or anything like that which is like it's just rock and roll pop punk are there like, any ballads um there's like one that I wrote solo and like I didn't even want to put it on the record but the boys made me because they love it um it's called Am I allowed to say in all the album titles? Why not, right? It's called Dare to Love Me. And that's a song that I just wrote by myself at the piano. And it's, um, yeah. 
it's just like tapping into the like vulnerability of like going there again and like being able to go there again and open up fall in love and also like are you really ready like don't tell me you love me unless you mean it was that scary to go there again mm-hmm. yeah. oh yeah definitely did working on the record help um, Did it make it less scary or almost more scary because you're in one way you're documenting it right yeah, I right. feel like I'm pretty good at, like, keeping, like, work and then my personal, like, for myself, like, even though they that was attached, like, I'm very much ruled by, like, relationships are number one to me and, like, my love life and my family and home. That's, like, my career is, like, number one t- as well, but, like, that's, like, number one to me. And you've it's, always been that way? Mm-hmm. So, so in terms of you talked about a lot of songs there, um, Bite Me is a, is is the first song we'll hear. Yes. And I think we're in the future right now, so I think it's out. Yes. I, and everyone's loving it. <laughs> it's number one around the world. Um, but that was a song that I was, when they played it for me over here, I said, uh, sonically, it's like the heaviness of the second record, and then uh, with like sort of maybe more of the pop sensibilities or the sensibilities, rather, of like mm-hmm. a girlfriend, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> so it's a, you don't, did, yeah. did you feel that intersection at all? Because that's, that's what cool. stuck out to me, and that's what I loved about it, yeah. is the heaviness there, and also just the attitude. The attitude is like... I mean, it's out so we can talk about yeah. it, but I was saying, dude, no one is saying this on the radio yeah. from your vantage point. And mm-hmm. also just like the heaviness. Super sassy and kind of just like, you know, someone who wants a second chance, but like they fucked up so royally. They're kind of not really worth your time. And it's like they realize after the fact that like, you had like a really good thing going on and um, you're sort of like the one that got away. I mean, I've been in that situation like a couple of times where it's like someone like fucks up royally and then you break up and then it hits them what they had, what what you had together and how great it really was. And it's it's a song like about self uh, self-worth and really like standing up for yourself and just being like, you know what, uh, you didn't treat me right, you didn't treat me well, and that doesn't work for me. So, baby, you can bite me. It's one of the most badass songs I've heard in, in a very long while. Cool. And the heaviness is, um, the, it's the guitar playing, and that's what like I love about this album. It's like guitars, electric guitars, all the way through, like Goldfinger, John fucking Feldman doing his thing and doing it so well. And like a few of the records, like in the past, you know, it's like it's like ah, uh, you know, like guitar for a while was like sort of like scaring people Mm -hmm. and there you know we just really went I went for it on this album I was like I want to rock out from the for the whole album I don't want to hold back live guitars live drums say whatever the fuck I want to say and just go for it because you know like you can get in your head a little bit there is like a little bit of a game with like record labels being like well we need to appease radio and like you can't swear and we can't have guitars there are no guitars anymore and like you know um and now like we're musically I feel like anyone can do whatever they want right now which is great it is cyclical but like emo music, pop punk music, whatever is like kind of having to come back or whatever you want to call it. Like it's always been there for me. Um, and it's music that like I've started with and have loved like my whole career and have always played my whole career. But like people are really having an appreciation for it again today. Yeah. And um, so it felt like, you know, just having like Travis Barker, John Feldman, and like dope ass people to work with, like Machine Gun Kelly and Mods, and all of us in the studio together, we all just like kind of come from that and do that. And I felt like we all just complimented each other. Yeah. And I didn't have like a label there to be like, don't do this and do this. Nah, 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 nah. So I just did what I wanted. And I love it. So MGK, you've collabed with, of course. I heard that song too. That's yeah. a really great, almost like a duet. Of uh, yeah, you, you go back and forth. Yeah, on the a record. full-on duet. <laughs> Anybody else you collaborated with that you'd like to talk about on the record? So there, I think this is really the first album where I have like a ton of features. Um, I have like a few, but I don't think I'm supposed to say. Okay, we'll keep an eye out for them. Um, you announced tour dates in Europe for next year. Do we know anything about tour outside of Europe? 
Yeah, so basically, just drop Bite Me, the first single, right now, and then um, January, second single, and then we have a record coming out top of the year, and then I'll tour next year. So in March, I'm touring Europe, and then I'll do Canada, and then I'm going to be doing a summer U.S. tour. Very cool. And next year is the 20th anniversary. <laughs> of course. Skater Boy of the first album. Does it Let feel go. like 20 years? I don't know. Yes and no. Does it? Does it feel like 20 years? When I think about, yeah, I mean, it's one of those weird things, right? Where it depends on how you want to look at it. Because you can look at it one way, you go, man, that feels like yesterday. And then you go, man, that feels like forever ago. I remember illegally downloading Skater Boy on, <laughs> I think, like, Kazaa. Did you ever, did you ever, were you buying records back then? Oh, yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So you weren't, on, you weren't on Kazaa or LimeWire or any of those no. things. And I wasn't either, allegedly. Buying CDs <laughs> for the first, probably till 15 years ago, right? So you never got down with like the file sharing? I didn't. I'm not like great with that stuff, like electronics and computers and all that. No, I was like old school. I like bought like CDs until like couldn't until the stores closed. Yeah, were you on like AIM back in the day? No. Wow. I always wondered that as a kid. I was like, I wonder if these people are on this <laughs> message. Do you know what AIM is? Nope. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> like I don't really know what it is. You don't know what AIM is? I don't think so. <laughs> You don't have any inkling as to what AIM is. I don't think so. No, what is Have it? you ever heard of AOL Instant Messenger? Yeah. That's yeah. AIM. Okay. I'm just being well, cool. I'm know. shortening it. You heard um, of that, though. Yeah. Okay. I didn't do that either. Okay. Like, I didn't have a computer growing up. And then I went on the road. Right. And then I had a flip phone. I just, like, wasn't... Like, flip phones, flip phones were really hard to text on. Yeah. It was a pain. So I bet it wasn't even until, like, I had a BlackBerry. That I was like really. Do you have a sidekick? I did not. Isn't that funny though? You're this. I've talked to um, other artists in here where you're this icon of this era, and there's all these other markers of that era that you just didn't like necessarily participate in, right? Because <laughs> like when you get so ubiquitous as you, it's like, I don't know. It's like it's it's like we associate you with all these things in our life, but it's kind of ironic. Yeah, I'm just like, like at that point in my life, I just was like eating, breathing, sleeping, music, and traveling, and touring, writing, putting out a record, doing a promo tour, repeat. And, like, kind of, like, lived in a bubble. Yeah. Or, like, lived on a tour bus. <laughs> I've uh, I've heard you bubble. I've heard you speak with such a, a love and affinity for records like I'm With You and My Happy Ending. And Do you have, like, an official Avril, Avril's favorite Avril songs? Like a top five? Could you yes. rank them? Oh, you do? You've thought about like this. Like mine that I like Yeah, I'm play. saying like Avril Lavigne's favorite Avril Lavigne songs. Like the top five. Um, yeah, I, I actually really enjoy playing I'm With You Live. Um, it's really emotional. And the crowd the crowd has a different response to like a song like that than like Skater Boy. Um, this is when everyone just like you can just like feel the power and like people are crying you can feel the emotion like lighters are going up or cell phones and i feel it every time i sing that song like even though it's been like 20 years now so i'm with you in the top five i'm with you my happy ending skater boy girlfriend and bite me okay in all seriousness, are there records on, on this batch, these 30 songs, are there records yeah. that are like your all-time favorite? On this album? Yeah. I feel like this album is one of my best records. Like Because we wrote so many songs, I picked my top ones. Like The songwriting is really strong. Lyrically, melodically, the production is so strong. Um, you know, like it's produced by like Travis and, and Feldman and Maude, and we've got like Travis playing drums on some songs and Feldman playing guitar on some songs and it's just like there's a lot of like the songs are so anthemic and they're a lot of fun and it's like even though it's just like a, me, about me reflecting and looking back at either my past or what I had just been gone through like in heartbreak or whatever it's it's like kind of me like poking fun of myself and love in a weird way and it's fun it's like lighthearted right the, uh, the video I forgot to ask you about, Bite Me. Mm -hmm. Hannah Lux Davis did it. Mm -hmm. How'd you wind up working with Hannah? Um, Hannah Lux Davis and I had been wanting to work with each other for a long time. And 
So we finally got to, and it was like everything I could have imagined. She was just like so great. We had, oh my God, I had the most fun shooting this video. I laughed the whole time, like the entire time we were shooting this video. So like I started, so Travis is in the video, and I started the day out. <laughs> falling out of my trailer like I open the door and I'm in these crazy heel boots and instead of like going down the stairs I open the door like all the way so there's just, like this hole and I just like step down and like plop and like laid there on my butt and everyone was just kind of like <gasps> and it, I was like <gasps> I'm okay but it was like such a fall it's like collective gasp uh, fall a bit such a far fall <laughs> and like I was okay but like I like I find that stuff like really funny, like um, physical comedy, and I like laugh the whole. <laughs> I laugh the whole day, <laughs> even at nine a.m. Yeah, um, I said, I'm glad I fell, because then it just like made their whole day funny. <laughs> oh, and then I kept falling. So like I was in a performance scene with Travis. He's on the drums. I'm like holding the guitar, playing, and I fell. <laughs> I just like because the floor had a hole in it. We we're like in a warehouse. And are you in these big? You're yeah, in these so big. Still yeah. I'm in these big heels, and we're in a warehouse, and on a cement floor, and there's like all these. It's not like smooth. There's like all these holes and stuff, and this I like fell, and like kept it together and stood back up and kept kept my composure and kept performing. And then like when we were done with the take, I like turn around and I look at Travis. I was like, Did you see that? And he was like. Oh, he's, I thought you did that on purpose. I was like, oh, dude, you like looked over and thought it was like this, like rocking <laughs> yeah, out on the right. floor. I was like, no, I fell. And then we like laughed so hard and then I fell again. There's this like other scene where we like, Travis and I like but break into my ex-boyfriend's house and we go storming in fiercely and I stop there and I look at the guy, at the ex-boyfriend and I'm about to chew him out and then I fell. I fell again. <laughs> um, now that you're back, in closing here, looking ahead, of course, you gave us the dates and sort of like the game plan, uh, you know, for the for the rollout. You've collabed with Willow. Is there anybody else, you know, outside of the people on your album that now that you're sort of back and you're active and especially with this scene sort of thriving right now, anybody you really admire out there in music you'd love to collaborate with? with collaborating with Willow is great. She's fantastic, and I love what she's doing musically right now. And she's kicking ass and taking over and I'm so proud of her and working with her on Grow was such a pleasure um, and we got to perform this, we shot a music video and um, we performed it together also with Travis and um, so I loved that and um, hopefully she and I do some more set performances or whatever together in the future I adore her and um, I think it'd be cool to do a collab with Billy. Because she's the shit. And, and you guys have met. You guys met yeah. at the Greek uh, a number of years ago. Yeah. And she's a sweetheart. And, um, yeah, I have a lot of love for her. And um, it's been great seeing her, like, evolve and grow, too, now. Like, with her, her second, the latest album. Um, she looks beautiful. And the songs are great. And she's just, like, so awesome artistically. Right on. Yeah. Billie Eilish. Um, well, very, very cool. Let's do one last thing before we let you go today, and let's play Bite Me on the Radio for the first time. So I'll let you do the honors. This is Bite Me on the Radio for the first time ever. Mm -hmm. What would you like to say about it? Um, I'm so stoked. It's finally here, my brand new single, Bite Me, uh, and featuring Travis Barker, and check it out.